All right. I think we are now live on YouTube. Uh, welcome to everybody who is joining me on this session to talk about how to launch tasks, how to launch math tasks for maximum engagement. All right. So let me just do a couple All of things right. here. I think. There we go. All right, so hopefully we won't have any technology issues. This is my first time doing YouTube Live, so thank you for joining me. I'm super excited that uh, some folks are here to see how this goes. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about some strategies to help your students engage more with the mathematics that we have to teach on a daily basis. I'll give you four of my favorite techniques for making like sparking curiosity and really trying to make the math irresistible, get kids to lean in so they actually want to do the math that we have to teach them every single day. So we'll go through those. I'll give you some examples. And then many of you registered online and submitted some of your own math problems that you were looking for help on. Like, how can I take this and make it better? How can I craft an experience where kids will actually want to do this mathematics? So I'll take those live. And I have deliberately not a lot of prep work on them. I'm going to try and apply the four principles that I'm going to show, share with you, or four strategies that I'm going to share with you today. And we'll see if we can make some things that are better. So that's the agenda for this, uh, this uh, YouTube Live. And if you could, if you're out there in the universe, go ahead and type your first initial and maybe your last name in the chat. Tell me what you teach, what grade levels you teach or you coach just so we can get a little bit going in the chat there. And, and then I will share, I'm going to share some slides with you right now as we kind of talk through some of these strategies that you can use. So let me get that set up. There we go. So that should be popping up on people's screens. And this is very strange because I think there's a 10 to 15 second delay between what I'm doing in my office here and when I can see your information in the chat and when you might be able to see my screen change and so on. But hopefully now you can see my slides and here we go. We're going to launch some tax tasks for maximum engagement. All right. So let me make sure there we go. And let me say this. I almost forgot at the end of this, I will post a link where you can provide feedback for this session, as well as give me, give me your email address. And then we'll do a random drawing and I'm going to give away uh, one session of my workshop, how to make math more like video games. So I'm really excited about that. So be sure you stick around till the end. I'll give the feedback link and then you'll get an email, I'll select one person at random. You'll get an email for a free uh, chance at this course where I've kind of laid out uh, uh, through several lessons, how to really make math feel more like video games. If you want to check that course out, there's the link. I will um, post that in the chat as well as we go. So as we think about trying to launch tasks for maximum engagement, this is the fact that sticks with me wherever I go. If you've seen me present before, you might have heard it. But 56% of kids would rather eat broccoli than do math. And I mean, that is that is a huge problem. This is what my mission is in life, is to make math irresistible and break this cycle of kids deciding that broccoli is better than mathematics. And how do you do that? Well, I want to start with this premise that I know for me, certainly growing up and getting my K-12 math education here, that most of the time, a teacher would come in and not really work too hard to get us curious, but you would just say like, this is what we're gonna do today. So this is our objective. We're gonna learn how to add fractions or we're gonna learn how to factor polynomials or whatever it was. And this quote really sums up what I think is a, is a big problem. I would agree with Dr. Arthur Combs that the biggest problem in education is the giving of answers to questions that have not yet been asked. We have to start our math classes with questions, and then that sparks curiosity, and then we can answer those questions. Unfortunately, too often we do things in reverse, and then we wonder why students aren't curious about mathematics, because we didn't really 
do much to make them curious. All right, so I'm gonna start with this premise. Effective math learning starts with curiosity. If we don't take some time to get them curious, then we are doing all of our, us ourselves a disservice because they're not gonna learn as well for as long and as deeply as we want them to. So we need to invest a few minutes to get kids curious about mathematics. Awesome, Raj, how do I do that? Well, let me tell you this, just as a reminder, during high states of curiosity, students learn, their memory is enhanced. So if, if I learn something when I'm not curious and I compare that to something I learned when I was curious, I will remember that thing much longer if I was curious in the first place. And I think that's super important because of course we want our students to not just learn something in the moment, but actually retain that information. If we start with curiosity, we have a higher likelihood of that happening. And if we then test the student on those things, they will do better on standard forms of standard measures of academic performance. So this is just to remind you that there really is research behind this. I know it sounds good. Of course we should get kids curious, but like we actually know scientifically that this is the right thing to do. So how do you get kids curious? You have to create information gaps. That is a gap between what they already know and what they don't know yet. And what I'm gonna do now is just cut to the chase. Here's four strategies that you can use to get kids curious about mathematics or anything to be for that matter. And the, these are the four that I like. The reason I like these, because there are many, many ways to do this, is that for the most part, these are things that you can do fairly quickly and fairly easily with a little bit of practice. So what I don't want to create is a world or an expectation where every night you need to be on Teachers Pay Teachers or Pinterest or Google or Twitter trying to find a great task for your students. Sometimes you can do that, but a lot of times you're just not gonna have time to do that. So these are some strategies that I think you can apply pretty quickly. And we're gonna put these strategies to the test in this hour. So make it visual, invert the problem, ask would you rather and withhold information. I'm gonna give you at least one example for each of these real quick, just so we're all on the same page with um, what I'm talking about. So what do I mean when I say make it visual? Well, normally uh, textbook problems in general they don't have a lot of images or visuals attached to them or usually mostly words. Um, here, for example, I have a, a problem straight out of a textbook. Uh, the figure to the, uh, there is composed of six identical squares. The area of the entire figure is 150 square centimeters. What is the perimeter of this figure? Now, most students, if they don't have an affinity for math or don't feel super confident about math, will get lost in the jargon and probably never even see that picture. So when I say make it visual, I mean, take the words out, get rid of them, and just let the picture stand for itself. So this is it, take the words out. And then you can ask the two simple questions. What do you notice? Oh, I notice there's some squares here. How many? Oh, six, how do you know? Ask lots of questions. Uh, I counted them left to right, top to bottom, like you'd read a book, cool. Someone else might say, oh, that bottom one there, I moved it into that little uh, lower left-hand corner and I made a two by three array. And then I knew there were six. Or I took that one that's sitting there on the left by itself at the top and I moved it to the bottom right. And that was a two by three, a three by two array, I guess. And I saw six. A lot of people will say they actually visualize nine squares. Just three of them are missing, like a three by three tic-tac-toe grid sort of with three squares missing. So you're getting students to engage in some mathematical ideas to actually absorb what is this problem about before you burden them with a bunch of jargon, a bunch of numbers, things that are gonna turn them off. Then you ask, what do you wonder? What are some mathematical questions we can ask about this? We can ask, what's the area? We can ask, what's the perimeter? We could ask, if I move the squares around, does the perimeter change or does the area change? There are all kinds of things that we can do with this. So that's making it visual. Then I can launch the task from there after I've given students some time to make sense of this thing and get curious about what's the question to be, how am I gonna figure it out? 
And of course, I've removed all the information. So if we were going to actually do this task, you would then need me to reveal something like the area of one of the squares is nine or the length of one of the sides is 12 or the length across the whole top is 50. I don't know, but I could give you that information and then we could start puzzling through figuring out whatever it is we need to figure out. So that's making a visual. Uh, my second favorite strategy is inverting the problem. Oftentimes, if you take the givens and you unknown and the unknown and you reverse them, you can get something that is much better. So here's the most boring area problem that I could think of. There's a rectangle, its dimensions are three and four. What's the area? Three times four, compute. This is an exercise. You just do it, you get an answer, and you move on to probably another set of exercises that look exactly like this one. Extremely boring. Let me see if I can switch it around and make something better. Same rectangle. Now I tell you the area is 12, and I ask you what are the dimensions. That opens up the entire conversation. We have multiple answers. We have uh, we can now talk about factors, multiples. People might wonder about fractions and decimals. Can I make one of the sides a fraction or a decimal? What does that do? What are the numbers that work? What are the factor pairs that don't? It's a completely different mathematical experience. And all I did was flip it around, open it up. So this is another thing that can work with existing problem. You just flip it around, see what you got. Um, if you're familiar with Robert Kaplinsky's open middle problems, um, and there's the link there on the slide, uh, a lot of them, they give you the answer and they ask you to figure out what the inputs are. This is one of my favorites. It's a subtraction problem. And many of these open middle problems have an extra constraint, which makes them a little bit more fun and a little bit more puzzling. Uh, in this case, we have, uh, you have to fill in these six boxes with the numbers one through nine, and you can only use each of the numbers once. And you're trying to get as close to 500 as you can. And to me, this is a little bit of an inversion because I'm giving you the answer and asking you for the inputs. We don't usually do that when we're talking to kids about subtractions and differences. So this can be a really nice way to turn a standard problem, turn it into a puzzle and really get kids to think. And I love open middles because students are gonna have to do a lot of subtracting to figure out this one problem. So to me, this is like a one problem worksheet. It's got 50 problems sort of embedded in it, which is what I love about these open middle type tasks. Okay, that's inverting. Uh, one of my favorite strategies is would you rather? So here's a thing where I could ask you, how much, is this, how much is a pound of dimes worth? And most people in the room would not be curious. Kids will probably not be super curious about that. And if I change it to quarters, how much is a pound of quarters worth? Again, you probably wouldn't be super curious. But if I take these two things and juxtapose them together and ask, would you rather, you often will get something that is intriguing and sparks curiosity. It creates that information gap between, well, yeah, I don't know, pennies, sorry, dimes are lighter, so I'm gonna get more of them in a pound, but quarters are worth more. Ah, now I've got this weird thing. I don't know, I kinda wanna figure this out. So these are, uh, would you rathers are a great way to maximize engagement by sparking that curiosity. Uh, John Stevens has a web website to dedicated to these, wouldyourrathermath.com, if you're looking for inspiration. But I find that these are pretty easy to create just with regular math. If I'm talking multiplication, we're doing five times three, I might just ask you, would you rather have you know, five sets of three or three sets of five? To a third grader, that's a deep question and could have a surprising answer. Um, if we're talking percentages, would you rather get 10% off the price of something or get that thing with 10% more at the regular price? I don't know. Are they the same? Are they different? Is one really better than the other? That would you rather is much more interesting than if I just said compute 10% off or compute 10% more. Um, if you buy two small pizzas, is that a better deal than buying one large? Don't know. We'd have to look up the size of these pizzas at some one of our favorite pizza places and then decide if one is better than the other. But this is a way to get kids to think about various different topics and maximize their curiosity. And finally, um, withholding information, a great way to do that is Peter Lilliadol's smudge math, where you take a problem, you just smudge out some of the information in some non-routine kind of way and ask students to like figure out the puzzle. 
Over there on the right, you see a standard fraction addition problem, but I have smudged out one of the denominators and one of the numerators. Now, when I first did this, I wasn't even sure if you could solve it. So I played around with it. I think you can. And it just opens it up. It makes it like a puzzle and get kids to really wonder instead of being that standard routine stuff over and over again. And we're still gonna have a great conversation about numerators, denominators, common denominators, equivalent fractions, all that stuff that we need to do in order to actually add two fractions that have different denominators. So, and over there on the left, you see something similar for division with remainders. There's, uh, if you take a standard 34 divided by five is six remainder four, there's six ways that you could smudge out two of the things and open up the task. All right, um, so let's talk about now, those were my four little strategies there, uh, making it visual, inverting the problem, using would you rather, and trying to withhold information, making a problem numberless, like a word problem, making it numberless is another way you could withhold information, force kids to make sense and engage prior to actually just trying to do the math. Um, okay, so now we're gonna get into the, into the details here, this is gonna be exciting and scary all at the same time, is can we take an existing math problem, math task that you have in a book somewhere in one of your curricular resources and turn it into something that is much more engaging and rich and do it in a reasonable amount of time? Here we go. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and give you my sort of rubric, I guess, for how I try to do that. Hopefully you'll find this helpful and useful. So when I, I look at a task, I just flip open the book and I look through it and I say, okay, for this particular item, is this a problem or an exercise? And what I mean by that is, is it, is it meant to be something I practice as an exercise to develop a skill? Like you taught me how to multiply, now I just have to do four times six, seven times eight, you know, is it a worksheet of exercises? If it's an exercise, I, I probably just leave that alone. I think of exercises as good for practicing the skills but I wanna look for problems. Problems are things that if I gave it to the students, they don't already have a memorized algorithm or procedure that they can use to solve it. That's what I'm looking for. Can I, and if it's not a problem, can I change it in some way that makes it into a problem and not an exercise? Because I'm looking for tasks that we're gonna generate conversation, multiple strategies, um, right and wrong answers so that we can talk about them. I'm looking for something rich. Um, does the problem require any thinking? It's kind of a, a follow on to, is it a problem or an exercise? And then, you know, I, I also try to look at, is there something here that is surprising? Something that kids could discover on their own that normally we would just tell them from the book. Um, if I can, then I'm gonna try and leverage those things to make this more engaging. And then as stated in the book, how engaging is this problem on, one, on a scale of one to 10, one being, no one will engage, and 10 being no one can resist. Now, normally I find that textbook problems are in the three to five on my one to 10 scale. Of course, these are always in the eye of the beholder. You might grade them differently than me. I'm just trying to get a ballpark idea of, is this already you know, fun and engaging or not? If it isn't, then I need to do something to amp up that level of curiosity. Usually I'm gonna have to do that. Will I always be able to take a one, two, or a three on this scale, a problem that's a one, two, or a three, and turn it into a 10? No, uh, no, you can't, it's impossible. Can I make it from a one, two, or a three into a four, five, or six, or a six, seven, or eight? Yeah, I can definitely do that. Will I get lucky sometimes and end up with a nine or a 10? Probably. Will I get unlucky sometimes and think that I've made a six or a seven and end up with a two? Absolutely. And that's part of the, the art of teaching. We'll just keep trying things until we figure things out. But in general, I just wanna try and move it up the scale as far as I can, again, in a reasonable amount of time. I wanna craft a better experience. Uh, and when I say craft a better experience, I mean, I wanna always think about what are my students gonna feel? Not just what are they going to do or what am I going to do? But like, can I create that sense of wonder, surprise, and curiosity and using those techniques that we just talked about. So let's do one example. And uh, hopefully, even though there's like a 10 or 15 second delay, I can get some feedback from you guys in the chat as we do it. So here's a problem, super basic. What's 12 times 15? Now, if this is 
fifth, sixth, seventh grade, this is probably an exercise or it ought to be an exercise in the sense that students will have already learned some algorithms or some procedures or some ways to do this with the area model or standard algorithm or something. I wanna look at this from the perspective of maybe late third grade, fourth grade, where students don't have a procedure for this. So it really is a problem. Like we're gonna to have to take what we've previously learned, what we know about multiplication as repeated addition or area of a rectangle or whatever, and figure this thing out. Now, as stated, I would say it's not super engaging. It doesn't have a context. It's just like, hey, do this problem. I I'd probably give this like a one, two or a three on my scale of one to 10. But with the right audience, this could be a problem, not an exercise. And it would lead to some good thinking, right? There are many ways you could solve this. You could add up 15, 12 times. You could add up 12, 15 times. You could draw a picture. You could make an area. You could draw groups of so many different things you could do. You could break it into tens and ones and try and figure it out that way. Or um, maybe kids will come up with something I've never thought of, which is actually what I love when that happens. So I want to turn this into a problem for students who don't know a procedure to solve this already. OK, let me see. What can I do? How can I make this visual? Well, uh, here was my first thought. I will just draw an array, and I'll make these little tiles. This is, I think, if I counted right, uh, 12 rows tall and 15 columns wide. And I can just ask how many little squares are in this picture. Or I can ask you what you notice and what you wonder, and we can get to that question, right? Oh, I notice there's a bunch of squares in here. I notice it's a rectangle. I notice there's 12 rows and 15 columns. Cool. What can you wonder? I can wonder how many little squares there are. Awesome. Let's figure it out. Uh, well, also by making this visual, I opened up another strategy, which is literally count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Some students might do that, which is great because then I get to have a conversation about would you really want to do that for 72 times 83? Uh, probably not. You probably don't even want to even do it for 12 times 15. It's tedious. Mathematicians are always looking for ways to get around the tedious stuff. So that's one way to make a visual. You could probably think of better ways than me. That's it. I think if I ask this question, would it be more engaging? I don't know, maybe a tiny bit. Maybe I moved it from like a one to a three or a four. I don't know. But I just tried it, it's super easy. Uh, to make that, uh, it's okay. Let me try inverting the problem. Okay, find two, two numbers that multiply to make 180, which happens to be the product of 12 and 15. Okay, now, if I'm working with third and fourth graders, that could be too giant of a leap. If I'm working with fifth and sixth or seventh graders, this could be a great problem. So, depends on where I'm at, if I want to use this or not. I would say for this case, given that I said I was gonna work with kids who are just learning two-digit multiplication, probably this is a little bit too big of a leap. So I like this problem, but not in this, in this particular case with the goals I have in mind. Okay, cool. Would you rather? Okay, 12 times 15. Oh, when I think about 12s, I think about dozens, and dozens make me think about eggs. So I throw a little context on here. Imagine you need as many eggs as possible. You're going to make like the world's largest cake. Okay. Uh, maybe I could Google that and put a picture of that up there to spark a little more enthusiasm. But one of your options is you can buy eggs in dozens. You can buy 15 dozen eggs, or you can buy nine of these cartons of 18 eggs. You know, and you want as many eggs as you could possibly get because you want this cake to be as big as possible. Which one would you choose? Now, I think I have made something that's a little bit better. I think some students would be willing to put themselves on the line and say, you know what? I like A. No, uh, well, B. I mean, there's more eggs in each carton. You know, you're probably going to get more eggs. Now I'd rather have more cartons with a little bit fewer eggs. Cool. How do we figure this thing out? Then I let them loose, working in groups in a breakout room with a Google Jamboard or in person if I happen to be in person um, on vertical whiteboard surfaces, and they start trying to figure this thing out. It's going to lead to all kinds of great thinking. I like this. I, you know, again, I don't think this is a 10, but I think it's a five, six, or a seven. And lastly, withholding information. Could I like do a little smudge math on this? Sure. Smudge out the one, smudge out the five. Uh, I can tell you there's two two digit numbers here. They're being multiplied to get 180. What do you think they are? Okay. Again, if you're first learning multiplication or two digit multiplication, probably too big a leap. But this could be an awesome problem for a couple grades higher. 
because now I'm going to have to think about, okay, I need to get a zero. What can I multiply a two by to get a zero? Mm, five would work, zero would work. So I start thinking about like what fits in these little spaces and I start thinking about math in a completely different way while practicing some two digit multiplication in the process. So, um, you know, if you'd like at this point, go ahead and type in the chat, which of these you liked, or if you liked any of them, if you think any of them are better than 12 times 15. And I'll wait a few seconds for you guys to do that because I know there's a little bit of a delay, but I'd love to get your feedback on just like real quick, what did this, what do you, what do you like? And as we do that, I'll just kind of cycle through these again so you can remember what they were. There was the visual, there was the inversion, find the factors if they multiply to make 180. And there was a, would you rather? 12, 15-12s or 9-18s? And sponging it out was our last choice. And these were just my really quick um, attempts at using those four strategies. Okay, I got two votes for the eggs. Cool. I will say as a side note here, a lot of times people will say, this is a little soapbox moment, that like, you gotta make the, cat, the math real world, otherwise it doesn't work. And I just fundamentally disagree with that uh, notion that, okay, some votes for smudge math too. I love smudge math. And it's super easy to do. Anybody can smudge out some numbers. Um, but as I was saying, I believe that math is intrinsically irresistible. And a lot of times you don't need a context to make the math fun and, and amazing. But sometimes I can't, if the context enhances the problem, then by all means use it. And I think in this case, if I just said, would you rather have 12 times 15 or nine times 18, that's not nearly as interesting as the eggs. Like the eggs added to the concept, the, the, the engagement and the interest level. So I'm gonna keep the eggs, cool. Um, yeah, making it visual is extremely important, not just from a engagement perspective, but also from a, from a pedagogical, understand the mathematics perspective. So yeah, awesome. Okay, so that was, that was uh, prepared material. Um, now, a bunch of people submitted problems for me to try and sort of tear down and rebuild live. And uh, deep breath. Here I go. So here we go. This was one that was submitted. 40, 54 minus 23. What can I do? What can we do with this? If you have ideas like making it visual, would you rather, inverting it, whatever it is, put those in the comments. Help me out. Like play along, play this game along with me. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my iPad and I'm just gonna try and make some problems using these strategies, and we're gonna see. Whatever happens, happens. So let me stop sharing that screen. Let me make an attempt to share my iPad here. Give me one second. And if all is right with the technological world and the tech gods are smiling on me, you should be able to see my whiteboard screen. It's just totally blank right now. And um, that is going to be, hold on one second while I get everything situated here. Um, so let's, let me just make sure that you can. Yeah, okay, good. It looks like you can. So what was the problem? 54 minus 23. So let me put that on the screen. There we go, 54 minus 23. First question, is this an exercise or a problem? If it's an exercise like it on a worksheet and I've already taught the kids how to do two digit subtraction, in this case with no regrouping, um, I mean, fine, I can make a bunch of these and whatever. But I wanna think about this if this were a problem. The only way this is gonna be a problem is if I haven't, if we've never really played around with two digit multiplication, sorry, two digit subtraction before. So, in that case, let's assume we've got first or second graders who are just exploring this for the first time. I don't know, something like that. And they know their basic and subtract facts, but this is pretty big. Okay, can I make it visual? Sure, let's see, how can we visualize this? Maybe, so for visual, 
maybe I think of like a base 10 block representation and I say, you know, let's say we start with five, um, what do we call these rods or whatever, and four units like this, and I need to take away, you know, that. Maybe that's a visual way to represent this. And I just use that picture and be like, hey, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Oh, you know, those, do those represent tens? Yeah, okay, cool. How many are on the left? 54, cool. What's on the right? 23, we wanna take them away. Why does that work? And then I let them loose. And then we come up with some solutions. Maybe that's a way to make it visual. Uh, what's another way I might make this visual? I might literally, oh, I could draw 10 frames. So I'm not gonna draw them all, but I could imagine uh, drawing, you know, five of these. So there's five groups of 10 and another one that has four in it. And again, try to visualize what 54 minus 23 looks like. That's two ways to make it visual. Uh, I don't know if I've increased the engagement at all, but that was making it visual. Cool. Let's see. What else can I try? I can try inverting it. Give you the answer. Ask you to come up with the inputs. Okay. This could work. Let's see. So maybe like an open middle type problem. I have it like this. I'm doing it vertically just so we can see the place value a little bit better. Uh, what is 54 minus 23? Uh, 31? I tell you what, math is hard when you're, at, when you're in focus and you're on stage. Okay, maybe something like that. Maybe that's too big of a loop, uh, of a leap. So maybe I put this one in. Hmm. Could my students kind of figure out that four minus three is one and five minus two is three? Maybe. Is that exactly the same math? No, but it might be heading in that direction. Oh, I forgot an important visual. Silly me. Number line, right? Here's 54. Here's 23. What do you notice? What do you wonder? I notice there's two numbers on the number line. 23 is on the left. 54 is on the right. I wonder how far apart they are. I wonder what they are when we add them together. Cool. You want to know how far apart they are? Awesome. I wonder how we're going to figure that out. That doesn't lead me to a whole another set of strategies. I love that. Okay. So visual, I'm feeling good. I feel better now. Inversion, I feel like there's some value there. It kind of feels like a puzzle. That's a little more engaging. Uh, would you rather? Would you rather? Let's see. I need a context probably. Uh, candy seems like an easy context. Would you rather have? You know, you start, would you rather start with 54 Skittles uh, and give away 23? Or would you rather be the person who has 45 Skittles and gives away, I don't know, 32? Whatever, we can make some numbers that maybe are a little bit closer. Um, that could work. Now we can vote. We can make people choose sides. Either in Zoom, they can vote in Zoom, yes or no, or they can, in the classroom, move from one side to the other. Um, all right. Okay, oh, and someone typed in the chat exactly the problem I came up with, or very close. Okay, cool. So that's, would you rather? Maybe you can come up with a better context than me on the fly. And let's see, what was my last one? Making Oh, withholding information. So smudging things out. So let's see. Let's do 54 minus 23 is 31. And maybe I just smudge this one out. Hmm. Okay. Or maybe I smudge this one out. That could work. That's an interesting problem, kind of like a puzzle. Maybe they could use their base 10 blocks to kind of guess and check and figure things out. All right. I feel like all of these have opened up the mathematics to different ways of thinking. They are going to force the student to grapple with place value and think about this in a way that maybe they wouldn't if I just said, line them up, subtract them in columns. Um, so if you guys want to comment on which of these you like, I'd love to see what you guys think. Um, Hopefully you feel some sympathy for me trying to do this live, but there's some ideas. And then I'm, I'm reading a comment. For a harder problem, give them the digits one, two, three, four, five, and have them make a subtraction problem that solves correctly. Oh yeah, I love that. That's brilliant. Thanks, Shane. So that would be uh, something like this. 
I might need the digit six or zero to make this work if they're only gonna be able to use the digits once. Maybe use the digits zero through five to make this subtraction work. Cool, nice puzzle. All right, so again, we're on a bit of a delay, so go ahead and type your ideas in the chat or your, your thoughts on these different, different possibilities. And once I get a few, I will move on to another example and we'll just try and see what we can do. All right, so while you guys are doing that, I'm going to set up the next problem. Here it is. Anne ran 4.3 miles. Devin ran three times as far. How far did Devin run? All right, you guys are starting to give me feedback on those. Yeah, the smudge math, the open middle. Right, would you rather? Okay, so this is what I love. Every one of us is gonna have our own experiences, our own ideas of what our students like and don't like, what they'll be engaged with and what they won't be engaged with. But what I think is cool is we just, in, in five minutes, we came up with like five different problems. You might use one every single day because you're gonna practice subtraction for a while. Um, and then they're all gonna to lead to some different math, different thinking. So cool, good stuff. I appreciate all the feedback in the chat. How far did Devin run? So this is one that I was given to think about. And then um, how much farther did Devin run compared to Ann? Okay, so what is this? Like third or fourth grade word problem. Great, make it visual. How do I do that? How can I make this visual? How could I strip the words out and make it something they could just look at and notice and wonder? Let's see. Uh, well, I could imagine maybe drawing a little picture. Okay, this is my mathematician picture. Maybe I label this start. Over here, this is Anne. Obviously, you recognized Anne right when I drew her. And then maybe I draw a picture uh, like this. And over here, of course, looking almost exactly identical to Anne is Devin. And of course, Devin starts there too. And maybe I just ask you, like, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Well, I noticed that, you know, Anne is a certain distance from the start and Devin is another distance from the start. Devin is, who went further? Devin, of course. How much further? Uh, I don't know. About three times as far-ish. How would we know? Well, you might need this on a piece of paper or something so that you could, you know, measure it up and try and actually estimate how much bigger Devin is, how much farther Devin has run compared to Anne. So, there's a visual. And then what are some questions we could ask? Well, we could ask, how far did Ann run? How far did Devin run? Uh, how much further did Devin run? Those are all sort of obvious questions, I think, that would come up if I just noticed and wonder on this little uh, awful little picture that I drew, right? And then I could tell you, hey, by the way, team, I can tell you that Ann has actually run 4.3 miles. Okay, cool. Can we estimate how far Devin has run? Maybe not calculate it exactly, we just estimate it. Yeah, okay. If Anne's four, that's 4.3 right there. That's probably another 4.3 and another 4.3. I might add those up, right? I don't even, and then realize that, oh wait, adding the same thing three times, isn't that multiplication? Oh yeah, it is, cool. And then I can talk about how, you know, how to multiply decimals. Awesome. So that's making a visual. Uh, again, in all of these, I guarantee you guys can do better than I can. But that's visual. Let's see, invert the problem. What would that look like? Well, let's see, they gave me how far Ann ran and how much further Devin went. And they asked me for how far did Devin run? So maybe I give you Devin's and ask you to find Ann's. That could be inverting it. 
And a lot of times I'll layer these things together. So I might use the picture and invert it at the same time. So maybe I decide that, never mind, you're not going to get this. You're going to get what's 4.3 times the 3, 12.9, 12.9? I don't know. Hopefully. Wow, that's a long way to run. Devin's uh, run like six times further than I've ever run in my entire life. Okay, so I could give you that. That's inverting the problem. Now we're dividing instead of multiplying. If that's my goal, if I'm okay with that, I can use this. Um, I suppose I could give you this distance, the difference, and ask you to try and figure it out. If, if I was gonna do that, I might, I might then have to also tell you or draw by a diagram that indeed Devin has run three times as far as Anne, and then I give you this piece instead. Oh, that's this opening up to like some different different ways of thinking. Um, I kind of like that. On a scale of one to ten for engagement, I think the picture is better than the word problem. Um, the inverted version. If my students took it as a puzzle, then it could be better. Otherwise, I feel it's about the same. Let's see. Uh, invert visual. Would you rather? Oh man, how am I gonna would you rather this? I might add a third runner. Maybe I would add a third runner. Uh, let's see, maybe the third runner's name is Jane. I don't know, I'm super creative with names. And Jane is uh, gonna run 14 miles. And maybe not would you rather, but maybe who ran further, Devin or Jane, where what I gave you for Devin was just the fact that he tripled up on Anne and that Anne is at 4.3 miles. Okay, there's the would you rather. In one case, you have to do computation, in the other one, you don't. That could work. Um, again, you could probably come up with something that's more creative than that. Okay. Uh, a comment in the chat. Thank you so much. You could just say that Devin ran three times more than Ann. What are some numbers that work for both of them? That's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that. Ann, you're a genius, right? That opened it up to multiple answers. It still going to force me to think about what does it mean to multiply by three? Uh, I could throw a number in if I wanted to. Like, by the way, what, if, what would happen if Ann ran 4.3 miles? What would, it, what would we know about Devin? What if Devin ran 13.9 miles? What would we know about Ann? So we could talk about decimals if decimals is one of my goals. Okay, fantastic. And then the last thing is withholding information. So again, could I smudge some stuff out? Sure. You know, you're seeing an overlap of these ideas, right? And I think that's a good thing. It means that they all fit nicely together and help us generate some quick questions. So um, I think I'll stop there with this one. Feel free to type in the chat again, which of these you liked. Um, personally, I love Anne's suggestion the best, which is awesome. And I'm gonna try maybe one more of these before we run out of time. So let's see, another submitted question was, okay, I guess we've kind of been focusing on arithmetic sort of stuff. So let me go with an algebra one here. Solve the equation, 15 is 4x plus 3. All right, so let me scroll up here, make a new page. And we're going to try 15 equals 4x plus 3. And of course, we're going to ask kids to solve for x, right? That's what we always do. OK, excellent. Uh, is there some rich math here? If we haven't already gone through all the ways in which you're supposed to do this, then it could be a problem and not an exercise. And on a scale of one to 10 for engagement, I would say not very engaging. It doesn't feel like a puzzle to me. It doesn't have any context that would make it better. It's not visual. Um, so we got to do some work here, I think, for engagement. Great. Let me make this visual. My favorite visual for these kinds of things is either a mobile or a balance scale, both of which uh, help students visualize the nature of things. So a mobile, maybe I make a mobile that looks like this. Um, by the way, there's a website. 
solveme.edc, I think. I'll double check that before I share. And maybe on this side, I'll make X's uh, diamond shapes. So I've got four of them over here. I'm probably gonna run out of space. So let me see what I can do. Four diamonds, which we don't know the value of. And at the bottom here is a thing that's worth three. So that's four X plus three on that side. And on the other side, I might just have a 15 hanging over there. Cool. And I know this is balanced because if this were a mobile hanging from the ceiling, this bar being flat tells me that the left side and the right side are the same. Can you figure out how much the stars are worth? Okay, I made a visual. Cool. Is that more engaging? Does it feel more like a puzzle? I think absolutely it does. It doesn't have that daunting X variable thing in there to scare me off. I think for sure this is better than what I started with and will lead us to thinking about, oh, taking away three from both sides and then dividing by four or something like that. Uh, another visual that I like is the balance scale. So may I draw a scale balance like this. This is my sad scale balance picture. And on this side, I put, maybe I'll use diamonds again, four diamonds. And instead of just like doing a three, I might do three dots and let the kids know that dots are worth one. So a dot is worth one, okay? So I have four X plus three over there. And over here, I would draw 15 dots. Um, I'll go ahead and do that. There's a three by five array, so we can kind of quickly get that. And again, like, can you figure out what the diamonds are worth to make this thing balance? And then I think students will be drawn to the idea of um, taking away three from both sides and then dividing by four. Uh, another thing I just thought of that you could do is you could actually add a dot to both sides. It's kind of a weird idea, but then you would have four groups of X plus one over here. Sorry, it's a little bit of a mess. And you'd have 16 dots over there, which I could then group into four groups. And then I could see that X plus one is four, and so X must be three. So some cool ways that you can maybe visualize that and solve it. Okay, uh, invert the problem. Give you the X and ask you to find some equation. Hmm, okay, maybe, maybe, let's see. So let me tell you that X is worth three. And oh yeah, maybe we do, maybe we do something like this. And we do kind of an open middle version of this. So this is a little bit of withholding information, a little bit of inverting the problem. Maybe I constrain you to a certain set of digits that you can use. There may be one solution, there may be multiple solutions. Use the digits one through four maybe and make this work out. Wow, I don't even know if this is possible. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but now I wanna kind of find out. Uh, could I even do this? I don't know. Maybe I put 12 over here and then I need, I have a three and a four left. This is three. Let's see, four times three is already 12 and then plus three is 15. Okay, didn't work, but I'm getting close. That could work. I like that, that's kind of neat. You'd have to obviously, obviously check to make sure it's solvable. Or if it's not, you could ask kids to get as close to 12 as you can, or get you know make this get as close to correct as possible. Okay, and then smudging things out. Could I smudge things out? Sure, I can smudge things out. I would probably smudge out both of these. Boom, smudge out the four and the three. Make those anything you want them to be. Cool, now you gotta play with it to make it work out. That could work. Would that work? I think that will work. I guess you'd have to also think about what X is. But I think that can work as well. So I think there's some good ideas there. Look, if you find a good idea right off the bat, you don't have to do all four examples. You can, all four strategies, you just pick the one you like and go. All right. I think that's probably a good place for us to stop. If folks want to Again, type in the chat what you thought about this algebra problem. Did I make it any more engaging? Did I make it open to more mathematical thinking? Did I make it a richer problem? 
you know, hopefully I did. And then we will um, close up for this uh, live YouTube. And I'm just going to quickly check out the comments. One person said, uh, my students love open middle problems. Yeah, openmiddle.com, Robert Kaplinsky's site, great stuff there. If you come up with a great open middle, you can submit them over there so that other people can benefit from your thinking. Um, if one, oh, going back to Ann and Devin, if one of them ran a marathon and the other ran a 5K, nice, mixing units, marathons are in miles, 5Ks are in kilometers. How many times longer is it? Thinking about unit conversion, you made it a more difficult problem, but you gave it kind of a nice context, which is good. Uh, over here, I'm seeing for this algebra problem, folks are liking the visual. Um, I could make it into a riddle. I'm thinking of a number that when I multiply it by four and add three, yeah, for sure. Brilliant. Um, I can get 15, what is that number? Nice way to position algebraic thinking. All right, cool. So before we go, remember, you can do multiple good things can happen to you for having come to our YouTube live. Uh, let me share my slide before everyone takes off. And so hang on one sec. There we go. We should magically be able to see my uh, slideshow. I'm going to skip there. There we go. So uh, let me. Let me stop sharing for one sec. I am going to share two things in the chat. Um, first, this is the link to my workshop that I'm giving away a free um, free workshop for anyone that attended. But if anyone wants to just check it out, it's um, on grassroots workshops. It's how to make math more like video games. It's uh, I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that. It's very similar to what I do in my PD sessions, but you can do it at your own pace from your own home. Um, there's lots of good examples in there and stuff like that, like we did today. And then if you'd like to get a little certificate and use this for some PD hours, here is my feedback form. So I would love it if you would click that link and give me some feedback. Tell me what, you know, was your takeaway from this, what you would have done differently to make it better for next time and punch in your email. Once we have your email, I can send you a certificate and enter you for the raffle of the giveaway of the uh, grassroots workshop course if you're interested in that. So those are the two things I wanted to make sure you have. I'm gonna share those on my screen as well. So they show up in the YouTube um, in the YouTube live. This is the link to my feedback form. And as again, again, that's in the chat. So you can just click, click it and go. And this is the, uh, the giveaway for the workshop. And finally, I will type one more thing in the chat. If you ever need to contact me, um, just hit me up on Twitter at Dr. Raj Shaw. All right, well with that, if folks are still around and want to just share in the chat, um, hold on one sec, maybe one of your takeaways from today that I would love to, to see like what your takeaway was. And then um, have a great rest of your, your day or evening, depending on where in the world you are. All right, I'll stick around for about 30 more seconds and then we will call it a show. A successful YouTube Live, no technical difficulties. I'm super excited. I can't wait to do this again. If you have other problems that you want me to uh, give a give a little whirl on this four strategy process. Shoot them to me on Twitter, and we'll just hash them out on Twitter. Oh yeah, math treats. Also, I post videos every week that I call math treats that are little rich tasks that you can share with your students and play around with. So um, check out. You're already on my YouTube, so check out my YouTube channel and look for the math treats. All right, well, thank, thank you to everyone who took an hour out of your day to come and hang out with me on YouTube Live. And until next time, just go out there and keep making math irresistible for your students. Thank you very much. Talk to you guys later.